We're in Melbourne with Daryl Stirk. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Daryl, what do you do professionally? Um, these days I'm uh, a uh, literary translator, mostly mm -hmm. Taiwanese literature. Translated a couple novels by uh, Umi Yi. And I'm in Melbourne to promote one of them called uh, The Stolen Bicycle. I'm also um, assistant professor of uh, translation at uh, Lingnan University in Hong yeah, Kong. Hong Kong yeah. It's Department of Translation and Translation Program. We've also got some uh, master's students and PhD students, but most of my students will be uh, undergrads. And I'm uh, just starting there tomorrow, actually. My oh, okay. first class at Lingnan is tomorrow afternoon. Good. How do you combine teaching translation and being a literary translator? Is it a happy combination? It's certainly a happy combination for me in that I enjoy teaching a lot mm -hmm. and enjoy uh, doing literary translation a lot. And um, I'm not an incredibly social person, so uh, literary translation agrees with me. And it's something that I do with my wife. Uh, she'll check my okay. translations for so accuracy. Your wife speaks what language then? My wife is from Taiwan. Okay. She, her native language is uh, Mandarin Chinese, mm -hmm. but her English is really good. And okay. she's a, a translator as well. Now, Darryl, um, you're not from Taiwan, are you? I'm from Canada okay. uh, originally. And um, uh, I'm not super social, but it, it's nice to get out of the house. I wouldn't want to do just literary translation yep. exclusively. So uh, I enjoy uh, um, talking to colleagues and uh, I enjoy working with students a lot. Do you take translation problems from your pro professional practice into the classroom? Uh, if it occurs to me, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. You don't ask your students for the answers to, to solve your problems. So. I will sometimes uh, take stuff I'm, I'm working on mm -hmm. into the classroom and see what the students do with them. Sometimes uh, they think of solutions that I haven't thought okay. of yet, so okay. I get my students to help out. Okay. Um, but uh, we do all, all sorts of stuff. So you, you've I got none of this reaction that we get among professional translators, especially of literary texts, against academic work. Mm -mm. You're, not, you're not one of these people who says... Theory is rubbish, practice is no, everything. No, no, no. I enjoy uh, translation theory, linguistic theory, mm -hmm. and use both uh, linguistics and translation in, in my teaching. And I think it informs my uh, literary translation as well. I wrote a, an article on um, grammatical artistry of uh, Chinese English translation or some such thing. Mm -hmm. I think the more you know about grammar, different theories of grammar, the more flexible you can be. So you're coming from a linguistic Background. I don't have a linguistics background. No, I'm a complete dilettante. Okay. okay. <laughs> In the word, world of theoretical linguistics. Can we go, go back then to when you're 23, 24? Mm. Where, where were you at that stage? 23 or 24, I think I was uh, in uh, my hometown, Edmonton, Canada, where I'd gone um, after a year in Taiwan, living with my grandparents and washing dishes for a living, I thought I can't keep on doing this for the rest okay. of my life. I um, uh, got got um, more important things to do, so I went back to Taiwan for a second year to be with my girlfriend at the time, who is now my my wife. Do you uh, study Chinese? <laughs> I, I guess I studied Chinese before I left for uh, Taiwan. I studied Chinese for about a uh, year in Canada, and then uh, arrived in Taiwan. And people people said, I, "I hear you can speak Chinese," and I had no idea what they were. Saying so, I don't know how much good it did me, but I, I learned, um, my wife, uh, my future wife helped me, uh, I learned pretty quickly. I think okay. I picked up Chinese by about six months wow. after I, I started living in Taiwan from comic books. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then children's, children's books, youth okay. uh, YA yeah. novels. All right. Okay, so you stayed in Taiwan for a long time? For two years, yeah. And then the second year I got bronchitis and lost uh, about 20 pounds and... Mm -hmm. Went home and flopped around for a couple of years in my mid-twenties and thought I was going to be a doctor and then a naturopathic doctor. And then I met a, a professor at University of Victoria, uh, the, other, the other Victorian Canada, uh, Vancouver Island, who kind of saved me. Uh, he taught, uh, taught me classical Chinese and started me uh, on, um, on Japanese. All right. And so he... he so you came back to study. I came back to Chinese, and then uh, he sent me to uh, University of Toronto, where I, I did a, a master's in 
traditional Chinese poetry and poetry criticism. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a sinologist, but I didn't complete my studies in sinology. I ended up doing a representation of indigenous peoples from Taiwan in, in film and fiction. Okay, and that's I, your I PhD? That, really? Yeah, I thought of that All as right, a kind of okay. cultural studies topic. Right, okay. Uh, so with that cultural studies PhD, you're back to Taiwan afterwards? Oh, I, um, cultural studies P PhD took me back to my hometown in uh, Edmonton, University of Alberta, where I was teaching uh, Chinese language and literature and translation mm -hmm. and classical Chinese and uh, and translation, Chinese English translation. Yeah, so for, how did you uh, get into literary translation? I started doing um, uh, study plans and reference letters in Taiwan. There's a whole industry in China as well of uh, fake study plans and fake <laughs> reference letters. Oh, that's fiction, right? So that's literary. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of fiction, <laughs> yeah. And I did that for uh, for a year, and and uh, Chinese improved a lot, mm -hmm. translating these uh, these these false documents. Into English. Yeah, right? they were kind of semi-false. It was more like a, uh, there was a form letter that you kind of adapted uh, depending on the individual student's uh, experience. But okay. they certainly weren't writing the study plans themselves. Okay. And the reference letters were all also kind of tailored so, to the students, so, so, but not right. written by the professors. Right. Signed by the professors, not written That's by not the professors. That's not good. How did you get into literary translation? Um, at, at the highest level, I mean. Yeah. After uh, pretty soon, in like 2001, I, I started doing um, freelance translation and because uh, English uh, native speakers are, are in demand, Chinese mm -hmm. to English, mm -hmm. I did everything uh, they had. I okay. did uh, technical translation, semiconductor in industry stuff. I did legal translation. I did military translation. So is it then a client who comes to you with a novel? It was, uh, like it was a, uh, a translation agency. And then... Uh, back in Canada to start my PhD, back in Taiwan to do a master's in uh, translation studies. And I had a teacher there, uh, Michelle, well, bless her heart, who introduced me to an um, a organization called the Chinese Pen, the Taipei Chinese Pen. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's part of the International Pen Organization. They do uh, translation of short stories. That's how I got into literary okay. translation in All about right. 2007. Through a social network then? Social network yeah. through my teacher. Okay. Right. No, it's just people ask us, how do I start as a literary translator? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, did you see yourself then as a translator? Sure. I think full time. By that point, yeah, I was yeah. Uh, a uh, technical non-literary translator, uh, first freelance translator. First, so I got to, to literary translation. I took, uh, took pride or really tried to get the technical... Uh, Terms right in in the one of the first stories I did I, I I put in rebar there was rebar in the original so I figured there should be rebar in the translation the uh, the steel uh, bars that they put into into cement mm -hmm. to make yeah. it stronger to make it concrete yeah and uh, the editor said well I wonder if the reader's going to know what rebar is and as a technical translator you can't imagine anyone not knowing what something so basic as, as uh, rebar is yes, who are these people they don't <laughs> know what rebar is. Yes, yeah. You, you. We, we've been looking at some of your translating. You have put an incredible amount of work into these texts. They're very polished, very uh, literary in their own right. Thank, you, thank do, you. Do you claim some kind of authorship? Uh, you no, work? no, no. I mean, I, I translatorship, sure. But um, in one of uh, the the first novel I translated by Wu Mingyi, mm. uh, Man with the Common Eyes, he, he has a line about uh, the the sun uh, shines with its own light, uh, the moon borrows to be bright. And uh, I've always seen my, myself as kind of the moon. <laughs> but did that rhyme in Chinese? It, it, it rhymed in Chinese, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. so you got the... Yeah, that's what I mean. You're really working on these texts. You're also yeah. adding a lot of information. You're using a lot of explicitation. Uh, in this the is... passages that we looked at, because uh, it um, involved concepts that, um, if translated literally, will mean nothing to, to the reader, mm -hmm. like emptiness, um, uh, so I, I feel uh, for things like that, which have this incredible, uh, incredibly complex uh, uh, intellectual tradition behind them, you have to explain just a, a little bit and give the writer, give the reader rather some hints about where they might look. Yeah, but you're um, using lots of foreign words there, lots of, of words in different languages. I mean, it's, it's a foreignizing text at the same time yeah. as, as, as you have these explanations. Yeah. So I somebody keep said the explanations at, 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 to a minimum and... Um, one of the biggest influences on me in the past couple of years has been um, 
Tim Parks' book, uh, Translating Style, because mm-hmm. he looks at I- Italian translations of, uh, of great modernist uh, works, mm-hmm. Virginia Woolf and, uh, and Beckett and, and so forth. And he's not impressed by, by any of them, any of these translations into Italian, because uh, the Italian translators just haven't understood the, uh, the original well enough. Yeah. And uh, they've normalized it. And uh, it's often easier to, to figure out what it's saying in the Italian translation than the English original. Um, and uh, so that book has turned me into a kind of super literalist. <laughs> okay. In, in my but own translation. Somebody ask you, are you, do you do foreignizing or domesticating translation? I, 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 do, I do both. And I yeah, think it's, that's, that's, it's dialectical and it's got to read well in, in the... In, in, in the translation, but it should be as, uh, as close to the original as, as possible. Sometimes it seems more important to, to stay uh, word for word or even uh, structure for structure. Okay. Um, stay as close to the, as possible to the original. What kind of research do you think we need in translation studies? Um, what, whatever whatever uh, individual uh, uh, scholars are, are interested in, I think um, it's important to uh, for a young scholar to bring personal interests mm-hmm. yeah. and experiences to uh, research. And my own background was, um, as I said, representation of indigenous people. So I'd always thought that this was a pretty um, soft topic. <laughs> what do you mean? Um, it involves a lot of background information, a lot of background knowledge. So if you're looking at a, a film from the 1960s, you've got to know who, who made the film, who the director was, who the actors were, who made the music, where they shot it, and who the production company was, yeah. what... Um, who financed it? Okay. What the uh, um, um, whether there was a censorship? What the um, so soft knowledge in the it, sense of it's just a lot of background knowledge, stuff, yeah. but it's not difficult to understand. So I yeah. always felt like I, I should do something intellectually more uh, more challenging. Like mm-hmm. the reason I like uh, linguistics theory is because it's difficult mm-hmm. to understand. It's hard, and um, I always thought I, I should learn an indigenous language. So. Um, I started learning an indigenous language that was used to shoot a movie called uh, Sadik Pali. It's called uh, uh, Warriors of the Rainbow in English, and it was released in 2011 in uh, Taiwan. Biggest movie in, in Taiwan film history. So I, I thought I'd learn this language and then do translation studies, do a, yeah. a comparison of the Chinese screenplay with the uh, indigenous uh, translation language that uh, it was translated into. So you've done this. No. Yeah, seventy or eighty percent of the of, of the of the film. I've got a, okay. an article I'm I'm working on, and um, it's a language that's uh, you said earlier. It's moribund, uh, meaning it's spoken by uh, just a few thousand people. Most of them uh, over the age of fifty. Very few under the age of fifty. So another twenty or thirty years, it's not going to exist mm-hmm. anymore unless um, language activists and uh, language revitalization activists are successful in, in convincing young people that this is a worthwhile uh, thing to do to look, to learn this uh, mother tongue. And, um, um, so indig- you're interested in the indigenous translation studies. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning work with indigenous languages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. meaning that, um, uh, scholars uh, who want to, to do this would have to learn, individual uh, indigenous languages mm. in order to do case studies of uh, the role of translation in um, self-presentation to, uh, to uh, mainstream society and also uh, the role of translation in, in language revitalization uh, efforts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of, doing this case study on the movie and I met all the translators that worked on the the case study, and I found that um, the translators often disagreed about um, what their traditional culture was in, in specific lexical items, culture-bound mm-hmm. terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like everyone knows what these culture-bound terms are, or what, what they mean. People have different ideas uh, about them. I thought that was really interesting. And I felt like they were reconstructing their culture, coming to an understanding of their culture through translation, even creating yes. uh, language and culture. Uh, through translation, and uh, I found they, they didn't care that much about the movie. I mean, <laughs> it's a big deal in Taiwan, but it's not a big deal to them. They're, the big deal to them is, is to, to keep the language alive in, okay. in some form. And I, I found this uh, somehow terribly moving, personally. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. it's so important to them, and I'm, uh, 
I'm not an indigenous person, but it did, just ended up seeming like um, the kind of thing, uh, besides family, because I don't have any, any religious faith, it seemed like the kind of thing that would be worthwhile for a person to kind of devote, devote himself to and try to do, uh, to, to do something helpful, to try to be uh, helpful to, the, to these people as they try to save their language. And that's what I want to try to do um, as a scholar of translation.